Um, as I came towards uh, doing my Leaving Cert, uh, I began to get involved in some uh, church activities, particularly working with um, deprived uh, young people. And I suppose that was one of the turning points that made me, that made me think. Um, I suppose at that age, I was 17, uh, a certain amount of idealism, how, how um, realistic I was and what I was expecting, uh, it's hard to know. I think in those days, 17-year-olds were a little more innocent than they are today. Uh, our, our exposure to the world was less. And um, for me, entering the, the seminary was quite a shock. Uh, because we, we, we suddenly uh, were locked in into another another sort of very isolated world. Um, well, as time went on, I, I, you know, you, you, I became very interested in, in theology in, in my studies, and uh, that then kept me kept me a little bit on the right track. Do you, did you ever have any regrets going throughout that process about maybe not pursuing the broadcasting uh, of the journalism? Uh, the broadcasting of the journalism, I suppose, faded a little bit. Uh, except that I, I'm left still with uh, an addiction almost to news bulletins. I, I, I constantly watch news bulletins. Uh, uh, and because that helped me a little bit later on in my life when I was working in international affairs. And, um, you know, I had a lot to do with, with, with journalists. But, um, you know, I became focused on what I w wanted to do. Uh, I thought that I would be working, you know, I entered the seminary for Dublin. I thought I'd be working in Dublin. Then my life took a completely different way and I spent most of my life living abroad. To come back to Dublin then at a later stage in a, you know, a position I, I wasn't expecting either. You, you said there that you found it you know, a bit of a shock going into the seminary, it was a big change. Obviously there are a lot of sacrifices involved with being a priest, you know, the yeah. vow of celibacy, I suppose, yeah. just being the one that everyone remembers. But what is it about the role that makes it so fulfilling and worthwhile for you? Um, well, I suppose I, I've been very fortunate. I've had a, quite, quite a, an interesting life. But you know, for it to be fulfilling, it has to come back to your, to your own faith. You know, that there are, obviously, there are days when you have you know, up and downs like anybody else, ups and downs. And um, facing the challenge will only, will only come if you, if you have your own strong convictions yourself. Um, but that doesn't mean that you try to force those convictions on others. Uh, the thing about faith in today's world, as opposed to the Ireland I grew up in, is that, um, and if you try to impose it on somebody, you're just going to get nowhere. Uh, I grew up in a world in which uh, faith was, was uh, you, you breathed it every day in, in, in Irish society, and uh, you know, the entire educational system was very faith-driven. People today have you know, come from a very different, different starting point, and um, on the other hand, you find that uh, uh, you know, young people are, are asking questions at 12 that we only began to think of when we were 21. Uh, so it, it's a very, it's a, it's a very, but the the, the, the satisfaction comes from, um, uh, from you know, the convictions of your own faith, uh, from the encounters you have with with people, and uh, you know seeing you know, how they interpret their own lives and how their faith has helped them. You you did spend a lot of uh, you have spent a lot of your life abroad. What can you tell us about your time spent in the Vatican? Well, you know, I, I lived in the Vatican for many, many years, and I worked in the Vatican for almost 30 years. Um, you know, you, it's like everywhere else, you, know, you have to get up in the morning and get on with your day's work. And you, know, I don't, you, didn't, you don't go around thinking, well, I'm in the Vatican today. You, 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 did, you did your work. Vatican is a mixture of everything. I mean, you, you, I was there for extraordinary moments, the, the funeral of Pope John Paul, the, the, the announcement of his the funeral of Paul, of Paul VI. Uh, and, and then I was there for all the banalities of the Vatican. You know, the Vatican is a place where about 700 people live and everybody knows one another. Everybody keeps an eye on one another and there's a certain amount of, of, of talking. Uh, I, I also would say that I, I met some of the finest people I've ever met in all my life working in the Vatican and, uh, and through my work in the Vatican. What were your relationships like with the Holy See at that time? Well, I worked for the Holy See. Yeah. And the, the Holy See is basically the governance of the, of the Catholic Church. And I represented the Holy See uh, in international life. I was the, the nuncio, the Va Vatican diplomatic re representative of the Holy See in Geneva at the UN organizations, at the World Trade Organizations, and, um, it's, uh, and was involved in, 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 in a whole range of international organizations. Strange experience so that you don't always, not something you could expect and that you could be, be trained for. But um, I found that uh, the, the Holy See could make contributions which were 
actually of, of some significance and get on extremely well with my colleagues from all over the place. The system of hierarchy by which popes are elected, yeah. what's your own opinion on this? Do you find that it's a fair, just system? Uh, the system is a, a, it's, it's a historical system where the pope is elected by, by cardinals. And you know, if a pope lives long enough, he will have elected all the cardinals. He will have chosen all the cardinals by simply by the fact that you know, there's a limited number and some die. Um, but if you look at the history, a pope, the cardinals, even though they may be, have all been appointed by a particular pope, they don't clone the next pope. It's an extraordinary thing that very often the, 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 the popes will say, well, we've had a very pastoral uh, um, uh, pope, now we maybe we need a more political one, or we've had a political pope, we don't want that again. And it's quite surprising the, 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 the differences there, there are in popes. I mean, the, the, um, after Pope Pius XII, been there during the Second World War and in the period afterwards, and they elected Pope John, who seemed to be a you know, a very different sort of man, an old man um, uh, who took, every, took the, the church then by surprise. Uh, they, they elected him as a sort of a pope of transition and he then called the Second Vatican Council which uh, you know, created an enormous uh, change in the life of the church. Would you feel that, um, that the holiness of the Vatican has been slightly compromised by the fact that it's now viewed as somewhat of a tourist attraction? Um, there, there are attempts to try and keep uh, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, you know, the, the areas which are areas of prayer to keep them quiet. It works very well in St. Peter's Basilica. But you know, anybody who lives in St. Peter's, it, it, if you go in there very early in the morning, it's a, it's a, it's a magnificent uh, experience. And you, when there's very, very few people there, and you, you've got the morning sunlight, which is actually quite, quite, quite striking. One of, my, one of the things that, I, uh, that happened to me when I was very, very young there, um, I was in the Sistine Chapel on my own with the key in my pocket. Uh, and that is a rather unique experience. You wouldn't be able to do that. The Pope couldn't do that today because the alarm systems are so such so that to turn them off, it, it, it takes nearly a day. Um, but you know, the, 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 some of the areas have been, have been, and there are corners of the Vatican, even in the, area, the, the areas that are most visited, which are kept uh, quite, remark uh, quite, quite quiet and calm. Um, the Vatican uh, has been a patron of the arts uh, over centuries, and art is linked with, uh, with beauty and with, uh, with reflection. It's not simply just for, for tourism and historical points of view. And um, the interesting thing that the first revelation of God was through creation, uh, which God revealed himself particularly in the beauty of creation. So this, this long history of um, you know, uh, um, developing and patronizing the arts, there were some magnificent things there, which are irreplaceable and immovable in many ways. You can't take the Sistine Chapel and transport it off to, to, to New York. Um, uh, one of the, Pope Paul VI tried to have a, a, a museum of modern religious art, uh, again, to see what uh, uh, people of today could, could bring as their contribution uh, you know, to, to reflection. Some of the material is, was quite interesting, some is you know, pretty, pretty, pretty poor. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what uh, our generation and our civilization brings in terms of uh, religious art that can inspire people and uh, touch their hearts. I remember uh, many, many years ago uh, going in the time of the Soviet Union on an official visit uh, very, at a very difficult time. And I was given an interpreter, a young Russian girl, and uh, we, were, we, were, we went to a, a Russian Orthodox monastery, a little bit outside Moscow. We actually had to get permission to leave uh, the city. And um, it was quite amazing. When she saw these icons, she was stunned. And something came out within her, which was in her genetic makeup, you might say, as a Russian, to see the beauty of these and to be struck by them. Um, I suppose I would have had the same experience occasionally when you'd be living abroad and suddenly you'd hear Irish music and, and you know, it, you, you'd be jolted uh, uh, as, as something that, you know, that's mine. <coughs> so religious art um, can speak to people in ways that, um, uh, that, that surprise us.
<coughs> just to backtrack yeah. there for a second, you mentioned the previous popes, the popes that were there during your term in the Vatican, and about yeah. the kind of popes that yeah. they were. I think you mentioned the Pope of Transition. Yeah. How or what kind of a job do you think that the <coughs> current pope is doing, and what what's he the, bringing? The present pope, compared to his, his previous, first of all, he, he, he Pope John Paul was fifty nine when he became pope. Uh, this man was over eighty when he became pope, uh, <coughs> just on eighty, uh, which is a huge difference. Uh, secondly, he, he wasn't over eighty; he was just below eighty. Um, secondly, he's, he's, he's an academic theologian, and that's one of his great talents. Uh, <clears throat> he's, uh, his talent is, is actually in, in reflecting. He's written two books already as Pope uh, on, on, the, on, on the life of Jesus, trying to dig out the, the, the modern research that's been carried on. Uh, <clears throat> that's, one of, that's his great talent. He has an amazing ability uh, with language to express himself and to express theological arguments. I lived in the German institution when I was in Rome, and he used to come uh, always uh, during Holy Week and preached on one of the days. And it was always very, very striking, his, his, uh, <coughs> his sensitivity and his extraordinary um, way of, of, of uh, using language to express uh, deeper things. Now, in 2005, you spoke out about homosexuality in the priesthood, and you said that you personally had no problem with it. What was the reaction from the church to that statement? I, I said that I, I, would, uh, I would not automatically rule out a candidate who was, uh, had a homosexual orientation, um, provided that the person was, uh, uh, you know, that he would be uh, as, as anybody else, that he would commit himself to celibacy and live that out. Uh, and um, um, I would stand by that uh, still. Um, but you know, th th there would be another uh, case in which if, um, if a particular sexual identity became dominant in a person's life, uh, that would be inappropriate uh, as, as uh, any other form of domination by, uh, by, by sexual orientation would be in a person's life. That the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the priest becomes a priest uh, to represent uh, and, and to, to present the message of Jesus Christ and therefore, he himself is not at the center of that. And you know, that if, if my personality becomes dominant in my life, um, uh, then actually you're not really helping the preaching of the gospel. Uh, this is why I think that, um, uh, you know, that, that no, no one dimension of my personal life should uh, dominate. I'm not, I'm not a zombie as a priest either. I mean, that I, I have to be myself. Um, but you would have to have a, a clear distinction between those two things. Did you receive any criticism for your stance on that? I, I, in almost everything I say, I receive criticism. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it's, I, I, read, I read a thing today on a blog, which had been missing for a long time, which says that I am clearly an agent for the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, in that, I'm acting. My brother was the Irish Times correspondent in Moscow, and they say that we, we're. we're uh, we're still keeping alive the, the, the old communist system. So you, 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 you know, as a bishop, uh, I have to, um, have to preach the gospel. I make comments. Uh, I, I, if I make a mistake, I apologize. Uh, if not, I stand by them. And uh, you're not going to please everyone. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, you just have to have the, 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 the courage to say what you, you know, what, what, you really believe in, and to take the decisions about that. I've had to take, as Archbishop, you know, decisions and lines that I really never thought I'd be even involved in on, on, on difficult issues. And um, your credibility is linked with the, the, the authenticity of the way you take decisions. Um, you also recently said, you spoke about the family unit in Ireland, saying that you believed it was still strong. <coughs> what is your opinion on cohabiting couples and couples that are having children out of wedlock? Do yeah. you think that that poses a threat to the... I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't like to, you know, to make judgments on any individual, and, and uh, I, you know, I know many people who, who live uh, and make these decisions. And certainly the decision to get married and commit yourself uh, is, is one that one should, should think about and think about o over time. Um, uh, very often, there are very few people who sort of decide we're going to cohabitate for life. Uh, very often, it's, it's, as time goes on, particularly if children arrive, uh, people then begin to, to form uh, something which uh, is, is, is necessary actually for the, for, or, or is for the good of the children, that the stability is there. Um, uh, I think you know, the church has sometimes gone about 
the teaching on marriage in the wrong way, uh, rather than by saying you can't do this or you can't divorce, in the, uh, rather than teaching what, what, what is the value of fidelity uh, and, and what does it mean in today's world? And what does it mean in a world in which um, you know, there's a throwaway everything? How is it that, uh, is it possible for a person uh, to stay faithful, if we say a husband and wife and, and towards their children, and wh what are the underlying values in that? Uh, <clears throat> every marriage that breaks down uh, started off as in the hope that it wouldn't. And um, I think we should be doing far more to help young people understand what fidelity is, uh, how you work on that, and to see that sticking to uh, something uh, is a value um, which gives tremendous uh, support to children. I, I do confirmations on, uh, you know, on a regular basis of this season. The number of children who take as their confirmation name, their grandparents' name, is amazing. And what is it that they, that they, they find in their grandparents? Uh, it, it's very often this fidelity, uh, this wisdom that they've acquired over the years, and which the grandparents would probably tell you wasn't easy. Uh, but it provides for, for, the, for the grandchildren today an anchor in a world that's very often, uh, very often uh, doesn't have, parents don't have the time, uh, at times they, they're there, and the grandparents have that, that, that wisdom which has been gathered and they have the time to say that to their children and to talk about these deeper values. And children, even at a young, young age, um, they, they, they see that. Um, the other negative side is to look at the, you know, the, the, the effects of um, where families do break down or where the family as an institution uh, and uh, breaks down, or where you, 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 you know, parts of, of, of uh, uh, in any large city particularly, where all the bonds of social integration break down and uh, children are the ones who suffer most in that. And very quickly now, before we jump out to the audience a little bit, um, why is it, do you think, that fewer and fewer people are joining the priesthood and is, what do you think that can be done to combat that? Um, I, I think that you know, just currently uh, there are a number of things. The, the scandals have put many people off uh, themselves thinking about the priest. And the scandals have put many parents off and saying, you know, saying to to uh, um, you know to a child, look, you know, just wait, uh, you know, uh, think about it. It's a difficult life. It's a it's a different life. Fundamentally, however, we're going through a a crisis or a rethinking of what faith is all about, about what church is all about. And um, it will take time before you get uh, young, young men who will come and think again uh, about making that lifelong commitment in, in the church that they're living in. Uh, I think we, we, um, uh, we, the, the priests of the future will come from different backgrounds. And I, I believe we're not actually approaching uh, uh, enough uh, young people on, on subjects like this and you know, generating a certain enthusiasm for the life of priests. You know, if, if, um, if young people see priests, priesthood simply as a, as a, as, as a sacrifice and a burden, uh, you know, they'd think twice. Um, there are many, many uh, other opportunities that are, that are there. Um, I, I, I wonder if uh, there had been opportunities for broadcasting when I began when I put where I'd be now. But <laughs> I, I had the unfortunate thing of uh, doing my Leaving Cert the year after RTE television was established and all the jobs had just been filled. <laughs> okay, we're going to take um, a couple of quick questions from the audience just on what we've covered so far because, of course, we will be going into depth with more things after this. Yeah. Uh, you explained earlier that a lot of your career was working in the Vatican uh, earlier on, but now obviously you're, you're working back in Dublin. Which work do you think was more important? Your work in the Vatican or your work now in Dublin? Um, uh, I suppose the, the, the people in the Vatican would think that my work here in Dublin, and, and it is, I mean, it's a very, it's a very, very big challenge. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my work. I was very fortunate in my work, uh, and uh, I put a lot of, I mean, anybody would know me, put a lot of effort into my work. Uh, and uh, I was known, for example, at meetings to be somebody who was always on top of documents uh, and, and so on. And I, I had fascinating work. Uh, I mean, I traveled, I suppose, to about 80, at least 80 countries. Uh, I was in um, you know, war zones, I was, met dictators, and I met, I met you know, human rights activists. And uh, you, know, you, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were seeing um, 
uh, some of the, 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 the challenges that the world is facing, some of the horrors that the, the, the world is facing. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I also was one that I, I, uh, I grew up in the tradition that you, 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 you did what you were asked to do, and you did what you were asked to do well. Okay, will you take one more? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, one second. You were talking there about um, the drop in uh, people joining the priesthood. Yeah. Um, would a way around that be to allow um, priests to marry, or indeed for women to join yeah. the priesthood? And is that something you yourself would countenance? Because yeah, I, I think that the, the uh, you know the, there there is has been a tradition in the Roman Catholic Church to have some married priests. Um, I, I'm not sure whether just at this moment uh, it would be the answer. I think the fundamental problem today, uh, and it affects everybody, is actually the fundamental crisis of faith, uh, and. Um, uh, I, I think one has to, to, to attempt, uh, here in Ireland as well, to, to build up that new sense of faith. And uh, um, I, I think also, however, that we, we, we have to get away from a church which is so clerically dominated that people think the only thing of importance is to be the priest. Uh, that shouldn't be the case. It wasn't the case in the early church. Okay, we'll have more time at the end for more questions and Deborah Naylor is now going to take over for the second part of the interview. Thank Thanks you. Yeah. So um, the first question I want to ask you, Father, is um, many people would have presumed that you would have been promoted to Cardinal this year and I was just wondering, were you disappointed when you didn't receive I, the red hat? I, I'm surprised that people would be thinking that. Uh, there is a Cardinal in Ireland uh, active and it would be very unlikely that another cardinal would be appointed in Ireland uh, as long as he's active and alive. And uh, there are good reasons why uh, the cardinal was appointed in Armagh uh, uh, as a sort of a sign of the unity of people north and south. And um, I have enough problems of my own, or enough challenges of my own. But a third of Irish Catholics live in the Diocese of Dublin. It's a very big diocese and uh, uh, I've got my hands full there. So you don't believe that it was something to do, no. um, there was a cardinal, it wasn't anything to do with your outspoken views about no, the church? No, I don't think so, I don't think so. I've no, no, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I have never, nobody in the Vatican has ever said to me, you're too outspoken, shut up. Uh, yeah. If anything, the, 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 the Pope personally has always been extremely kind to me. And uh, we, we've spoken about, uh, about my work and uh, you know, he uh, questions me about, about my work. and. Uh, uh, in no way was, was I ever given the, the, the message uh, that it was otherwise, and um, uh, you know, I've been very o I've been very open in the Vatican, not just since I became Archbishop of Dublin, but uh, in my time there, I was considered to be a person who uh, would um, would speak his mind, and uh, as one person said, not only did you speak your mind, but you you managed to get your own way. And on uh, the issue of speaking yeah, your mind, yeah. do you? Would you feel like you deserve the position of cardinal more than, say, for instance, someone like Sean Brady who no, was involved? I, I, I wouldn't. You know, I, 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 if, if, you, if you go through life you know, thinking you're either a victim or that you should, should have something better, then you'd be very miserable. You, know? uh, you, you, do, you, you, know, you, you do the job you're in. Uh, there's nothing as frustrating as, as meeting people whose only theme of conversation is that I really should have been something else. Uh, um, if anything, um, but 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 uh, what upsets me is that you know what I haven't done right and what I have not been able to do in the job that I've been given, and um, this is I think something that uh, maybe it's one of the first signs of getting older. Um, you know, when you're younger, you're full of idealism and you want to do things. Uh, as you get older, you begin to see that you ha actually haven't done that, uh, and there's there's a real sense of um, of frustration. Uh, when that happens in life, or, or a sense that you, uh, um, you know, that you, you, you haven't got the energies then to do the things you really wanted to do. Is there, is is there a sense like, of regret in anything you've done, say for instance in 2010 when you didn't um, force the resignation of Cardinal Sean Brady? Was that something I mean, you I've regret I've, 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 I have you know, I've never uh, demanded the resignation of anybody. Uh, I, I, I've always said that uh, in the face of any, people should be accountable. Uh, accountable doesn't mean resigning. Accountable means explaining yourself. And uh, it, it's not my job to dictate to anybody else uh, how, how they do that. But I do think I, I had a right 
particularly after the publication of the Murphy Report, to ask those who were involved to, you know, to, to explain to, to people what had happened. But you didn't um, think I, that it was your own... I, 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 you know, I, what worried me was the, the danger that after something horrendous taking place, that the answer would be nobody, nobody is responsible, that it was a systems failure rather than the individual responsibility. Certainly in, 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 in many matters, people, there, there were matters that were dealt with by various people, and it's very hard to sort of say, well, this person or that person was the person who made the, uh, the determinant decision. Um, but I think we all have to learn that, um, uh, that you know, we, we share some responsibilities uh, for simply our, our participation in, in, in things. Uh, you know, if I come and say, um, uh, you know, that well, I was only responsible for the sugar in the cake, and I wasn't responsible for the for the whatever other things are in it, and uh, then then you know, you know okay, I, I was only responsible for one thing, but. I was part of something bigger, and I, I think we have to learn, uh, we have to learn that in a wider sense in in, in Irish society, uh, there's the sort of a tendency that if anybody makes a mistake, they're called to, to resign as the only way. Uh, Just with regard to responsibility, yeah. with the issue of clerical abuse, would you say that the priests who are directly involved are responsible, or is the Catholic Church as a whole should take that responsibility on board? Um, obviously, there's you know, the, uh, you know, there is there is the level of personal responsibility. If somebody abuses a child, uh, there, there is a, a level of moral, criminal, uh, and legal responsibility for, for that action, and they are they, you know, they are responsible for that. Um, one, well, the the difficulty uh, was that uh, at a particular time, uh, for some reason, uh, there was a lot of effort into saying you know, the, the the reaction to some priest who has done this is to cure him is to heal him, is to give him a second chance. And um, uh, Should they have been expelled from the priesthood straight away? Expelling from the priesthood, but they should, they should have been stopped, that's the important thing. Um, but why, that, why was there, can you give any reason, why, is there, why was there so much clerical abuse in the Catholic Church? Uh, why, why there was, the, 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 the question we have to ask is, why at a particular time this emerged? Uh, you know, it, it, that if I try to look back on the documentation that's available to me, um, you know, it, it, it is something that was there in the past, but much rarer. Something happened in the 70s and 80s. This would be right around the world when the, the numbers that emerged were. were, were and do, were you have, do you have any? Do you think there's any? No, I, I mean, everybody is thinking about it, and there's some historical research being done on it. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it may have had something to do with the, with the times. Uh, the culture that was there. It may have been that the church um, somehow or other uh, lost, uh, its, lo lost its sharpness in, in evaluating, in, in, in looking at who they were taking in uh, to the priesthood. Um, do you think it, it was anything that which they attracted a certain type of person? Had that anything to do with you know, you, it's a, you know, I, I asked the question, you know, I mean, myself, uh, I haven't got the, the immediate answers to it, but what I can say, and this would be would come from the from the, the evidence there in the Murphy report that um, there was uh, there were in a particular period of time a, a small but significant number of serial pedophiles who were in the priesthood and uh, the, 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 certainly the first lesson you've learned is the serial pedophile has to be stopped instantly uh, that the the, the, the allowing uh, a, a person like that to go back in any way into ministry. Uh, you're putting them in the wrong place and you're putting a huge number of people at risk. Uh, and that, that lesson has to be learned. Now, it's not everybody has learned that lesson. Um, sometimes uh, uh, you know, those who abuse are very able in you know, getting their side of the story out and almost as presenting themselves as a victim of repressive bishops who, who won't let them back into ministry. Um, uh, and was it very, very difficult for you as a priest de dealing with this type of you know, with all the, as the abuse came out, and was it hurtful knowing that you played no part in it, but being part of the church, the you thing, may be associated the, the, the thing that, that, with that. The, you know, for me, um, the determinant thing for me was meeting victims yeah. and hearing their stories. You couldn't but be, be, uh, be shattered. Uh, as I said to a number of occasions, probably the, the emotion that came out most in me in dealing with us was anger. 
angry that people's lives were wrecked in this way. And not just the, the people who were actually abused, but their parents, their spouses, their children, all sorts of people. For every one child that was abused, the lives of so many people have been shattered. And I can remember meeting uh, parents and uh, you know, have this carry with them and will carry with them forever, uh, the sense of guilt that they didn't do enough. And even among uh, survivors, the sense of guilt that they should have come forward earlier and other people would have been, would have been saved. It wasn't possible for them to do that. And has uh, that anger, that <coughs> sorry, has that anger ever made you actually contemplate leaving the church? Um, you know, I didn't have the, 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 the luxury of, of, uh, of thinking about that. Uh, the, but but what, what, I, what the anger is that uh, anybody who tries to play down the level of suffering uh, and, and, and there, you know, or people who are saying, um, uh, well, you know, it, it wasn't me, this never happened. It happened in, 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 in the, the Church of Jesus Christ and it shouldn't have happened in the Church of Jesus Christ. If you look at the, the way Jesus talks about children, he describes them as being, uh, you, you won't enter the kingdom of God unless you become like a child. So there's something that he would say in the life of a child which makes that child which tells us all what the kingdom is about. And for somebody to have abused the innocence of a child, and especially uh, you know, when, when you look back at the time, uh, you know, everybody was, was, you know, there was in, you know, nobody thought of the child. Uh, and and the, I'm the, aware the, that um, there was an incident, and um, I know you've spoke about it before, um, you, you were, there was an incident you were involved in as a young child, um, with a paedophile, and as it was that something that's made you yeah, speak I, no, out I, about? I, 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 you know, I, I was, you know, it was a very simple thing that I, you know, I was mm. stopped on the street by yeah. what would, we would have called then a dirty old man, and he began saying appalling things to me. You know? Is that why you're so outspoken now, though? Because no, I know I you. No, it, you know, it, 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 the, the thing that made me um, reflect on this was, was listening to victims, okay. uh, and you know, had that been done earlier. Uh, I mean, some of the survivors felt that they, when they came, they were looked on upon, upon as being a, wanting to attack the church, uh, um, and you know, there, there wasn't that sensitivity to say, you know, what's happened to this person's life. And as you go on and think of it, you know, um, you see, the, the sexual abuse of a child isn't just about the physical things that happen; it's about power. And it's saying, you know, the, the person who abuses a child says to them, I can do anything with you. And you can imagine the effect of that on the self-esteem of a child later on. That suddenly they feel that, and you, 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 you meet children and you, now they're, you meet them as adults. And um, uh, you, 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 um, you first of you to try and, and think of you know, what they were like as a child. And listening, some of them then can come and, and do, you know, to explain and you try to understand that, you know, here you had this man who was a good man. And very often, see, uh, pedophiles are, are not monsters to look at. They're actually very often charmers. And uh, uh, so you had the, the child, his, his mental ability to, to see how could this man be good and be doing such terrible things. Do and you think people never will ever be able it. to forgive you know, any victims, will they be able to forgive the Catholic Church? Um, I, 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 you know, I, I hope so. I've met people who've actually forgiven their, their abuser. Uh, you know, that, that's, uh, and it is possible. And uh, in many ways, um, forgiveness is, uh, is, is a very strong thing to do, uh, to forgive somebody. And the person who arrives at being able to forgive, it might be one of the signs that they've actually really come through. Uh, but you, you know, the, the, the um, uh, you know, it, it is a very, very strong thing to do that. It's also a very uh, strong, it requires a lot of courage to ask for forgiveness. You see, I could bump into you as we're coming in the door and say, sorry. Uh, it could mean something or it could be just an empty formula. But when I say sorry, I'm still in control. If I ask you to forgive me, I'm placing you in control. 
Uh, and that's a very different thing. Has the Vatican done uh, enough, do you think, to say sorry to those victims? Uh, I, I think the, the, the present Pope has, has, has done this on, on many, many occasions. Uh, uh, and I think that the, the structures that the Vatican is putting in place and trying to put in place worldwide are, are a sign that there's been a real change in, in, in their And are they going, will the Vatican be um, responsible for compensating um, those victims, or does that come from you? I, I think that the, 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 the decisions were taken on a local level. Um, the, the Vatican intervenes very rarely uh, in, 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 in my life. Uh, uh, you know, the, but would I, the funds, the, the actual funds, come from the Vatican the to funds, compensation the, those victims? The, 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 um, the compensation of victims who were abused by priests in Dublin is, to a great extent, my responsibility. Uh, and uh, so far we've been able to do that with funds that we have we have managed to put aside. But should the and Holy See not have more more involvement in uh, this? I don't th you know, the, the, you'd have to show that the Holy See was actually involved in specific decisions and uh, th th there's, you know, the, 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 that wasn't the case, as mm -hmm. I can see. I mean, I, I um, uh, again, uh, you know, there are people who, um, I, I believe that uh, you know, compensation uh, you'll never compensate uh, a person for the damage. Uh, there is a sense in which um, a, you know, a, a providing support and counselling for people and you know, a financial gesture, uh, which is a clear recognition of the fact that uh, you, you're assuming uh, responsibility for what happened to them, uh, is something that... But more, more important than that is, is uh, I try as far as possible, any any survivor uh, who receives compensation uh, to meet them personally, and um, uh, you know that that in another sense is a way in which you help people to arrive. At closure isn't the word because it, you know, you you have no idea. Uh, you know, people who seem to have 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 a reached closure, then something can happen and it can bring it all back to them again. It's a very complicated and it's a very sad situation. Just um, with regard again to um, the financial control of the Vatican, yeah. is there too much control from, from the inside of the Vatican? Because I've been there myself on a few occasions and I have to say the first thing that struck me when I went there is just the vast amount of wealth that was there. And what I kept thinking back of is in the time in, you know, when it was the famine in Ireland and you had people, mm -hmm. you had money being sent to the Vatican to, to build up this wealth of art, this wealth of buildings. Is there just, I mean, could the Vatican not have done more? to help, say for instance, I mean, they could probably have the financial ability to, to end world hunger. Uh, I mean, I, I, as you said to your, to your colleague earlier, you know, the, the, the Sistine Chapel, which is the, you know, one of the most magnificent things, you just simply can't move it and sell it. Uh, it belongs uh, to history. And we see in Ireland the, the, the efforts we were making to, um, you know, you, you, each, each, each country and each, each has, has its own heritage, which it belongs to its past belongs to its history. And the promotion of art was, was one of the extraordinary things in the Vatican. And what the Vatican does actually is it, it makes them available uh, to people from around the world uh, as, as, as an experience and an, as an education. But should it selling not be trying off, to promote off modesty to, more? Sell, selling, mm -hmm. them, selling these off uh, to wealthy businessmen who'd lock them up in their houses uh, I don't mean solely art. Doesn't help. Yeah. Um, I don't mean art, yeah. but there there is a sense when you go there. There's, um, I suppose, it, it. Some of it feels quite material, and there's yeah. a sense, I suppose, that Catholicism, you know, should be about living a modest yeah. lifestyle that isn't materialistic. And sometimes that seems to be slightly different yeah. when the, you do go know, to the the, 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 um, the artworks represent the art and the thought of particular periods in history, and at times there certainly was this sense of triumphalism. On the other hand, um, uh, you know, there, there, there are, there are uh, you know, little pieces. You, you, art is an amazing thing. Uh, but you know, the, the St. Peter's Square, for example, when you go into it, is, is it's a stunning thing. Uh, and um, the artists who work there uh, were, were very, very taken by, by proportion. Uh, and, and, and that's also even linked with, with like, you know, with, with uh, yeah, with, with the progress in humanity as well. Yeah. Now, Dr. Martin, I'm, I'm aware that we're running short yeah. of time here. I just want to ask you very quickly about the issue of patronage. 
um, in yeah. schools. And obviously, you have spoke out about this earlier this year. And I'm just wondering, do you think it, in, a, in a case where we are going to be divesting the patronage, um, is it better for children to learn all religions for a young age, from a young age, or for them not to learn any religious teachings in school? Um, I, you know, obviously, that's a matter for, for their parents to, to make the decisions about. Uh, I believe that um, uh, the teaching of religion, if done correctly, uh, can actually open people's mind and, and learn about, uh, about, about different religions. But the formation in a faith tradition is something that I actually can be very enriching for a child. Um, uh, the, 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 what, what we should be doing in, in, in any education isn't dishing out formula for people to learn, uh, but helping people to reflect and asking the basic questions about life. Uh, if, you, if you simply say in, in school you can't talk about religion uh, or you can only talk about a general history of religion, you may not be a, a encouraging young people to, to learn uh, even about themselves. There's a certain sense in which um, we, we'll only fully discover ourselves when we find those spaces where we can go beyond ourselves, above ourselves. And that's what trans transcendence is about. If we only live in the day-to-day -day practicalities of life, we may not even ask the basic questions about what life is about and why we're here. And these are our fundamental questions. Um, they are more pragmatic than many people think uh, because values determine the way we use the resources. I was at a thing this morning about the homeless and um, the sort of quality of services we provide for homeless tell us a lot about what we think of people. That if we decide that the homeless are, can, uh, you know, are worthy of, of second class and poor quality uh, care, then, then we're saying something. So it, these questions about you know, human dignity, about um, solidarity, um, w which are fully embedded in the Christian message, are, are very important for the type of pragmatic decisions we, we, we will be making in the future. And just one final yeah. question. Yeah. Um, obviously, you're, you're Archbishop of Dublin and you hold a very high role in, in the Catholic Church of Ireland. And I just was wondering, is there a discussion at the top level in Ireland at the moment about the future of the church, about where it's going and about how you can manage to, you know, to engage with people more? I mean, this is the question that I, I, I'm constantly asking. I mean, some people say maybe you're, you're asking too, too many questions about your moaning. You should go and do something. Uh, we're doing something as well. But, uh, I mean, I, 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 I've clearly said that the, the, uh, the challenges that the Catholic Church are fa is facing in Ireland today are the greatest challenges it's had since Catholic emancipation, for example, in the, in the 19th century, when the Church came out of the, the, the time of, of persecution and had to rebuild itself. We have to rebuild the Church now today I I for the world of tomorrow. It'll be a very different Church. The danger is there's a sort of an, an inertia, and the Church, still, in some areas, still seems to think it can use the methods of yesterday to answer the questions of tomorrow. Uh, that won't work. Okay. Dear Barton, thank you very much. You. On, myself, on behalf of myself and Catherine Denny and all the production team, we'd like to thank you for coming this evening. Um, next week's guest will be Sheikh Hussein Halawa, um, Imam of the Islamic Cultural Centre of Ireland. And questions are welcome. They can be emailed to talkingheads at dcu.ie. Thank you. Just like to mention that tomorrow there's also a field trip leaving at 2 p.m. from the Interfaith Centre to St Mary's Pro Cathedral in Dublin, and any interested parties can contact Joe or Susan here at the Interfaith Centre this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.